from the Australian band In Excess. And watch out, because this one is going to go all the way to the top. In 1987, Australian rock band In Excess exploded on the scene internationally with their hit album Kick. But just 10 years later, their lead singer Michael Hutchins would be the centre of controversy and conspiracy behind his untimely death. With a lot of theories and rumours surrounding this subject, what really happened to Michael Hutchins? If you Google biggest alternative bands of the 80s, the top search results include iconic musical powerhouses like R.E.M., Duran Duran and In Excess. Between the late 70s and mid 80s, Australian supergroup In Excess went from little known pub rockers to international sensations that sold more than 70 million albums worldwide. And from the beginning, Michael Hutchins was the band's de facto spokesperson and most well-known member. Over the years, Hutchins' good looks, high-profile relationships and copious drug and alcohol use earned him a reputation as one of rock and roll's true bad boys. But as is often the case, the trappings of stardom led to a heartbreaking and untimely death that's still the subject of controversy more than two decades later. Michael Hutchins was born the second of three children in Australia on January the 22nd, 1960. His father, Cal, moved the family to Hong Kong when Michael was just four years old. And as a youngster, he often hung out with A-list celebrities like Nastasia Kinski on film sets where his mother worked as a makeup artist. Michael attended private school in Hong Kong and was a talented swimmer, but he became more interested in music and poetry after a broken arm sidelined his athletic aspirations. When the Hutchinses returned to Sydney in 1972, 12-year-old Michael met another young man named Andrew Farris, who had started a band called Dr. Dolphin with his two brothers and a few high school friends. After a few promising jam sessions, the group convinced Hutchins to join as the lead singer. Hutchins agreed, and along with Andrew Farris, he became the band's most prolific songwriter. Though Hutchins and the Dr. Dolphin crew had big aspirations, Michael was forced to move to California with his mother when he was 15 after his parents split up. However, he returned to Sydney a few years later and reunited with his bandmates. Dr. Dolphin made its official debut in mid-August of 1977 and after cutting its teeth playing the pub circuit with more popular bands like Midnight Oil, the group changed its name to In Excess in 1979. In Excess's first Australian top 40 hit, Just Keep Walking, was released in September of the following year. But things really took off after the album the Swing, released four years later. Then, in 1985, Michael met well-known English television personality Paula Yates during an interview for her show, The Tube. By then, Yates was married to Irish musician and Boomtown Rats founder Bob Geldof, and she and Hutchins wouldn't see each other again for nearly a decade. Meanwhile, In Excess's meteoric rise continued. When it was released in the fall of 1987, their album Kick peaked at number one in Australia number three in the United States, and number nine in the UK. Then, in 1990, In Excess released X, which included some of the band's most popular singles like Suicide Blonde and Disappear. The band was regularly selling out major venues at home and abroad, and Hutchins was romantically linked to a number of beautiful A-listers including Kylie Minogue, Belinda Carlisle, Alina Christensen, and Kim Wilson. Then, Hutchins and Yates met again in 1994 for another interview for a new show called Big Breakfast. But this time, the interaction between the two was decidedly the more intimate. Time, this is a guest that I want to have my leg over. And it is. It's the fantastically talented Michael Hutchins. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Where are you? A big Thank sex you. symbol or something. In fact, Hi. the interview took place on a bed, and in just a few minutes, the pair's legs had become suggestively intertwined. The chemistry wasn't hard to miss, but Hutchins was already involved with Danish supermodel Helena Christensen, and Yates was still married to and had three children with Bob Geldof. Nonetheless, the two began a steamy relationship, and despite Michael's reputation as an unabashed playboy, he apparently fell in love with Yates's daughters too. With a new lover waiting in the wings, Yates left Geldof in early 1995 
and by the end of the year, she was pregnant with Hutchins's child. Heavenly Hirani Tiger Lily Hutchins was born on July the 22nd, 1996, but a few months later, her doting parents' fiery relationship was on the rocks. Gossip columnists regularly reported that Yates had other lovers, and meanwhile, Michael had a brief affair with an American woman he'd met in a hotel lobby, and by this time, relationships and substance abuse issues, chronic depression, and Michael's inability to cope with stardom had thrown his life into a slow-motion tailspin. Nonetheless, In Excess embarked on a whirlwind tour in the spring of 1997 for the release of the aptly named record, Elegantly Wasted. The gruelling tour included 75 concerts in a dozen countries, after which Paula planned to meet Hutchins in Sydney with Tiger Lily and her three other children. However, the much-anticipated family reunion never took place. For 37-year-old Michael Hutchins, November 21, 1997, wasn't particularly remarkable. That morning, he rehearsed with In Excess while a crew from A Current Affair filmed the band for an upcoming segment about its 20th anniversary tour. Those who'd been around Michael that day said he was in good spirits. That evening, he met his father and stepmother just before 8pm at a popular Indian restaurant just a few minutes from the Ritz-Carlton where he was staying. Hutchins chain-smoked cigarettes and only picked at his meal, but his mood was normal and relaxed, according to the restaurant manager on duty that night. However, another staff member later told journalists that after dinner, Hutchins's father placed his hand over his son's and asked if everything was all right. Though it's not clear what Hutchins said in response, he may have shrugged his shoulders casually and told him that everything was fine. Then, at approximately 10.30, Michael and his father went to the Ritz-Carlton and had a few drinks at the bar. After Cal Hutchins left, Michael shared an elevator with two women, who also later stated that he seemed normal and relaxed. Hutchins was also seen with actress Kim Wilson and her boyfriend, Christopher Stollery, that night, though it's not clear if they went to his room. Staff members at the Ritz-Carlton confirmed that room service was ordered multiple times throughout the night, but they refused to say who, if anyone, was with Michael. Then at approximately 5 a.m., Guests in nearby rooms heard a loud voice or voices in his room, which were later determined to be Hutchins in heated phone conversations with Paula Yates and Bob Geldof. During one call, Yates told Hutchins that the custody hearing of the Geldof girls had been postponed and that it didn't look like she'd be able to bring Tiger Lily to Australia for Christmas. According to Yates, Hutchins was distraught and said that he didn't know how he'd live without seeing his daughter. Hutchins then phoned Geldof to beg him to let Yates bring the children to Australia, but he refused and later described Hutchins's demeanour as threatening and abusive. Then just before 10am on the following morning, a frantic and sobbing Hutchins phoned former girlfriend Michelle Bennett and said he needed to see her. Bennett arrived at his room 40 minutes later but got no response when she knocked. Paula Yates has tonight arrived in Australia where police hope she'll be able to help with their investigation into the death of her boyfriend, Michael Hutchins. At 11.50 a.m., a horrified hotel maid discovered Hutchins, naked and lifeless in a kneeling position facing the door, with a snakeskin belt clinched tightly around his neck. The other end of the belt had been tied to the automatic closing mechanism at the top of the door. When police arrived, they found that Hutchins had strained so forcefully that the belt's metal buckle had broken. They also noted that the tub was full of water, that the room was strewn with drug paraphernalia and empty liquor bottles. The New South Wales coroner released Hutchins' body after the autopsy was performed and the funeral was held at St Andrew's Cathedral in Sydney on November the 27th. While Never Tear Us Apart played airily in the background, Hutchins' bandmates and his brother Rhett walked the casket past sobbing onlookers to a hearse waiting outside. When it was released on February the 6th, 1998, the coroner's report state that Hutchins had committed suicide while under the influence of drugs and alcohol and distraught over the prospect of not seeing his daughter. But more interestingly, the report noted that Hutchins had two large contusions in the frontal lobes of his brain that had been caused by an unidentified trauma that had occurred well before he died in his room at the Ritz-Carlton. Michael's fast-paced life had caught up with him by late 1997, and nearly everyone agreed that relationship issues, depression, and drugs and alcohol were major contributors in his death. That said, 
the mysterious brain injury may have played an even more significant role. It all happened in 1995 when Hutchins was assaulted by an angry cab driver after he and Helena Christensen had been out partying in Copenhagen, Denmark. When the cabbie struck Hutchins after an argument, he lost his balance, fell backward, and hit his head on the concrete. Christensen later recalled seeing him lying unconscious in the street, but when Hutchins regained consciousness, he made her promise to keep the incident a secret and refused to go to a hospital. Hutchins may have shunned medical care because he couldn't bear another run-in with the paparazzi. But whatever the reason, the impact had fractured his skull and caused bruising and swelling in his brain. After the incident, Hutchins lost his senses of smell and taste and friends, bandmates and associates reported that his demeanor changed too. While producing a video for NXS after the incident, longtime friend and collaborator Richard Lowenstein recalled that everyone sensed he was different, that something was off. In fact, the generally happy and even keeled Hutchins had become noticeably more somber and depressed, and in some cases, aggressive. He also struggled to speak coherently and often went on totally unrelated tangents. In his documentary, Mystify, about Hutchins' life, Lowenstein also said that he believed that the punch from the cabbie in Copenhagen may have been the most pivotal event in the young star's life. A few weeks after the funeral, Paulie Yates suggested that Michael Hutchins may not have committed suicide at all. Instead, she claimed that his death may have been the result of an autoerotic asphyxia incident gone horribly wrong. However, considering Hutchins' distraught state just before his death, it seems unlikely that he'd have engaged in such bizarre sexual behaviour. On the other hand, Yates told detectives and newspaper reporters that in the past, she and Michael had engaged in autoerotic asphyxiation to heighten their sexual experiences. But Yates' theory was contradicted by Richard Lowenstein when he interviewed a number of Hutchins' ex-girlfriends, all of whom said they'd never seen or heard of him doing any such thing. Of course, Yates could have made a claim to deflect blame away from herself and the tumultuous nature of their relationship. However, she did disclose that she and Hutchins had discussed suicide on a number of occasions and that he'd always said he'd never do such a thing because it was the most selfish and cowardly act anyone with a child could commit. Likewise, the London psychiatrist who counselled Hutchins shortly before his death stated he'd never said or done anything that could be construed as suicidal. Then again, Lowenstein found a number of taped interviews in which Hutchins did bring up suicide, and in one, he actually remarked, no one minds if you kill yourself. And though it was decades old by the time of Hutchins' death, Lowenstein also found a stick figure with a noose around its neck scribbled into one of his diaries from the 1980s. In addition to the autoerotic asphyxia theory, Yates also suggested that Hutchins may have been murdered. In fact, shortly after arriving in Sydney after Michael's death, she told the Daily Express that Bob Galdoff had had him killed. Over the years, Michael's brother Rhett has also maintained that murder couldn't be ruled out, but no evidence has ever surfaced to substantiate the murder theory. After Hutchins' death, Paula Yates' life also began spiralling out of control. In addition to an ongoing custody battle with Bob Geldof and strained relationships with her children, Paula also learned that the man she'd always thought was her father actually wasn't. Then another domino fell the following June when she officially lost custody of daughters Fifi, Peaches and Pixie to Geldof. Unable to cope with the stress and traumas, friends said Yates turned to heroin after being clean for nearly two years. On September the 17th, 2000, she died from a heroin overdose and was found in her Notting Hill flat with her four-year-old daughter, Tiger Lily. Yates was just 41, and the coroner ruled that her death was accidental. With both parents dead, Geldof was granted custody of Tiger Lily so she could be brought up with her three half-sisters. Then in 2007, Geldof officially adopted Tiger Lily and changed her name to Heavenly Harani Tiger Lily Hutchins Geldof. Seven years later, in April of 2014, Yates's second oldest daughter, Peaches Geldof, also died of a heroin overdose at the age of 25. By then, Peaches Geldof was an accomplished model and writer, as well as a wife and mother of two young sons. However, she was often seen partying in swank London nightclubs, though she always firmly denied using drugs. In a statement after her death, Father Bob Geldof described her as clever, funny, wild, and beautiful child, and that he couldn't come to terms with the fact that he'd never see her again.
Hutchins's death will always be controversial, but Richard Lowenstein believes that Hutchins did commit suicide and that no one thing was responsible for pushing him over the edge. Instead, it's more likely that not being able to see Tiger Lily in late 1997 was the straw that broke the camel's back and that drugs and alcohol had exacerbated the already bad situation. It's also worth noting that, according to Lowenstein, Hutchins was a naturally insecure person and that Michelle Bennett, not Paulie Yates, was the one true love of his life. Whatever the case, NXS went through a number of lead singers in the following years. Then in 2005, the band participated in reality television series called Rockstar in Excess, in which contestants vied for a position as the band's new and hopefully permanent lead singer. Canadian JD Fortune ultimately beat the competition, but the title was later passed to Irish rocker Kieran Gribben in 2009. Gribben performed over 50 shows with In Excess, but by then it had become apparent that the band's glory days were well behind it. In Excess did enjoy moderate success after Hutchins' death, but during a concert in late 2012, the band announced that it would be their last performance. Thanks for watching. This has been the controversial tragedy of Michael Hutchins. What are your thoughts on this episode? I do hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you want to see one of your comments right here, then start a comment with Shadow Shoutout. And if you like this video, then don't forget to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to see more content like this and hit that notifications bell to keep up to date with the latest videos. And together, we can explore the strange, the terrifying, the unknown, the shadow matter.